30. Isaiah chapter 30. If someone next to you doesn't have a Bible, share yours with them. And read this scripture together this morning. Isaiah chapter 30. And we'll begin reading with verse 1. Isaiah chapter 30. And begin reading with verse 1. Thank God for this, this book. Isaiah, you know, is an amazing book in the Bible. Did you know that Isaiah has 66 chapters in it? The Bible has 66 books in it. Isaiah is a picture of the whole Bible. After chapter 39, there's a marked division. You read chapters 1 through 39, and then start with chapter 40, and it's just like somebody else takes over. The, it's completely different. It talks about the branch, the Lord Jesus. The Bible has a division after 39. 39 books in the Old Testament, and from Matthew 1, it's completely different. The book of Isaiah talks in the last, next to the last chapter about the new heaven and the new earth. The book of Revelation, next to the last chapter, talks about the new heaven and the new earth. On and on and on you can go with the similarities of the book of Isaiah to the whole Word of God. And it's amazing, and we thank God for it. We're going to break in on his prophecy here in chapter 30. When they were having some problems here, the children of Israel, try to bring him a message. Now, you pray for us. It'll come out right. That the Lord laid upon our heart. Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be in help, nor profit, but a shame, and also a reproach. The burden of the beast of the south, into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence cometh the young and old lion, the viper, and fiery flying serpent, they will carry their riches upon the shoulders of the young asses, and their treasures upon the bunches of camels, to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still." Now go, he's talking to Isaiah here, write it in a book, or before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall and swelling out in a high wall whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of a potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it assured to take the fire from the hearth or to take water withal out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. But ye said, No. For we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee. And we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, and the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as an ensign upon an hill. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, 
and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. In verse 16, you'll find these words. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, Hold Your Horses. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, you allowed us to come back to the house of God. Thank you, Lord, that most of all, that you sent your Son down here one day to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the sin debt that we could be saved. Now, our Father, this morning we pray as we look into this portion of thy word. God, you know the needs in this church. Lord, you know these people here this morning with all kinds of needs. And God, we can't see into their hearts. But I know that you can. And I pray that you'd move upon them. And Lord, may the message be just exactly what you want it to be. Nothing more, nothing less. We thank you, God, for the privilege of standing. God, we don't realize, I suppose, what a great opportunity is ours to stand and preach the blessed book of God. So help us, Lord, to be faithful to it and to you and to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in the evil day. Our Father, we pray the Spirit of the living God will take these words and use them for thy glory in this service this morning. Save that one which is lost. Reclaim that one which is walking afar off. And we'll praise you and thank you and glorify you for it. In Jesus' blessed name we pray, amen. As I was studying this scripture some years ago and a lot here recently, this chapter jumped out at me and these thoughts began to grab a hold of my heart. And sometime back I began to write them down and think about it. I feel like the Lord gave me this message from Isaiah 30, uh, the first few verses. I entitled this message, Hold Your Horses. There, you'll find the key thought in verse number 15 where the Lord said, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. In verse 7, the Lord said, The Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. Have you ever wondered where that old saying come from? When somebody's all ready to go somewhere and you say, just, just wait a minute, just, just hold your horses. Just hold what you got, you know. Don't get your dander up. Don't get to, you know, don't get, don't get to, to going too fast. Just hold your horses. Might have come from here, I don't know. But I thought about it when I read these verses. That's what God was saying to his people here. Have you ever noticed when something goes wrong, we just run around and go wild, go here, go there, do this, do that? A lot of times God would say to us, your strength is to sit still and wait upon thy God. Now pay close attention just a minute as I introduce you to this, what's going on in this chapter, and I believe you can get the message. In this chapter... Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was invading the land of Israel. And all the way through the, land, the Old Testament, God told Israel, he said, I will fight your battles for you. When they came up against the Red Sea, they didn't have to paddle across. God miraculously opened it up. When they came up against Jericho, they didn't have to fire a shot. But God fought their battles. God wants us to let him fight our battles. And brother, they came up against the Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and saw him with his armies and troops beginning to come down to the camp of Israel. Now you know what the children of Israel did? What were they supposed to do? In quietness and in confidence, just wait on God to save them. But they were a lot like me and you in this day. They said, no, we're going to get us some horses. Take off. The Lord wants us to do what we can. And so we're going to run from them. And they done the very worst thing they could do. Went down to Egypt and asked for help 
against their enemies. Now, Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world and a picture of sin. Pharaoh in the Bible is a picture of the devil. Now, can you imagine this? There was a storm coming, hard times coming for God's children. And instead of going to God for help, they went to the devil and the devil's crowd to get what they needed. And of course, the Lord said, this is not good. It's never good for one of God's people to expect the world and the devil and the flesh to do for them what God wants and intends to do for them. Never is good. Never is right. Somebody said one time, when you don't know what to do, don't do anything. There's a philosophy in our days, and I partly agree with it and partly don't, where preachers say, if you don't, if you, do something even if it's wrong. Have you ever heard that? They say, just don't sit there. Do something even if it's the wrong thing. And I agree with what they're trying to get across, but scripturally, really, that don't come out, out, out right in the Bible. Many times the Lord would rather you do nothing than do something wrong. He said, according to the word of God, he said, I had rather you just to sit and do nothing rather than to go out and get help from the devil and this world. Sometimes your best move is to not do anything. Do you know that? Sometimes you're more in God's will just sitting not doing one thing then you are trying to do this or trying to do that. Sometimes you're better off just to sit still and let God work it out. I heard about this man in the middle of the highway. And he's out on the busy highway and his car's whizzing in front of him and car's whizzing behind him. Now, which would be the best move for him to make? If he takes one step this way, he's going to be killed. If he goes backwards, he's going to be killed. Somebody comes up to him and says, man, do something even if it's wrong. You know what his best move is? Just hold what he's got until the cars get gone and then move in the direction in which he's going. Now, did you know that this world this morning, and the reason it's so very hard for us as Christians is because the world is getting faster and faster and faster in a rat race. The world is in a rat race. If you don't believe it, go out to town tomorrow. Go into any busy city. These cars bumper to bumper, blowing horns, businessmen, hurry and hurry and hurry and hurry. Everybody's in a hurry. It's like that guy come into a store one morning, you know, and he's this way and he's that way. And he didn't, he's trying to give him some gas. And they said, man, what's the matter with you? And he said, when he got ready to leave, he said, which way was I going when I come in here? And they said that way. And he said, oh, well, I've eaten breakfast. And went on to his work. The people are in a rat race these days. They're about half wacko. That's why it's so good for us to come together and sit still for a little while and know that God is on control and he's on top of things and he's watching over my problems and your problems. You've not got one thing in your life going wrong but what God don't know about. Amen. Amen. That makes me feel good. You know the only, people, the only one that can win a rat race is a rat. That's right. If it's a rat race, the only person can win, it's a rat. I'll tell you how big of a hurry people are in these days. I thought I'd heard it all, brother, till the other day I read that there's this fella in Atlanta, and he is a, uh, runs a funeral home. Uh, he's a, I don't know if he's a mortician, but he, he runs a place. And he said people are in such big hurries these days that when somebody dies, Many of them want to come and visit the funeral home, but they just don't have time. You know, back when you used to, in the old days, where the, somebody died, a whole community would go over there and sit all day and half the night and all over and talk to them, you know, and see if they need anything, take food in, all that. These days, people's about too busy. And you know what this guy done? He has installed the, the world's first drive-in uh, funeral home. And he has six, five big six-foot windows for those mourners who are too busy to come in and mourn, where if they're on their way to work or on their way home, get groceries, whatever, they can run through the drive-through. 
and look into a big window and there lays the dead man. You know, I said, poor old soul. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the truth. We don't have time to sit still anymore. Some days you'd, you'd be good off to take a day off work. If you can miss a day's work to be sick, wouldn't hurt you to miss a day's work when you're spiritually sick. Take a day off work, set yourself up in the closet with nobody or just the bedroom or up in the woods, with nobody, just you and the Bible, and you sit down and say, God, I'm going to slow down long enough for you to talk to me. That do every one of us good from time to time. Your head gets so cluttered up, you get so busy in the work of the Lord, you're backslid. Just sit down and say, God, give me some answers. God, clear my head. God, I hear this, I hear that, heard a million tapes. I just want to hear what you got to say once in a while. Brother God will speak peace to your soul if you'll let him. I don't want you to notice three things in this scripture this morning. I better hurry or I'll never get to. I was talking about this being still. Remember now, the picture is this. Sennacherib, king of Assyria. That sounds like a bad name, don't it? He come down out and getting ready to destroy God's children. They said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Somebody says, well, I guess we better pray. No, no, we better do something. Let's go down to Egypt. And they got on the horses and took off down to Egypt. Won't help. Number one, I want you to notice their dirty sin. Their dirty sin. Every sin is dirty. You know what people think? There's little white lies and gray lies. And if it's a real bad, it's a black one. But in God's sight, there's no such thing as a white or a gray, every sin is black in the sight of God. No matter how little we may think it is, every sin is dirty. See, first it was a sin of omission. Sin was something that they did not do. Look at verse number one. They said they take counsel, but not of me. God said your sin is something that you've not done. Boy, I'd like to have every church member in McDowell County, especially some that I know of, and set them in a big room and tell them that there's more sins than committing adultery, getting drunk, and robbing a bank. There's a lot more sins than cussing, brother. A lot of times sin is something you do not do. It was a sin of omission. That's a dirty sin. You say, what was it? They wouldn't take counsel from God. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you been taking any counsel from God lately? Have you been letting God counsel you? You say, well, I've been going down here to the shrink. Well, have you asked God about it? Have you asked God to help you with your problems? Have you got your Bible open at night and said, God... You are the best counselor. How about you helping me out, Lord? That was a sin of omission. Did you know that we have a whole book of counsel here? This book is literally filled. And you do not have one problem. And you don't know anybody that does have a problem. To what this book don't have the answer for somewhere. If it don't name it specifically, it'll cover it generally. This book has the answer and the counsel to every sin and every problem you've got. You've got sorrow, this book can give you counsel for, to console you. You have death in the family, this book can tell you what happens after death. Your judgment, sin, war, this book is a counsel book on all of them. Their sin was they did not even ask God what they should do. Look at that in verse 2. They walk down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. They not only just went away from God, brother, they didn't even bother to ask God what he thought about it. It always displeases the Lord when you have something come up and you just jump the gun and take off 
before you even ask God what he wants you to do. Now, Christians should be able and willing to pray about everything. You know why a lot of people won't pray about something and ask God what he wants them to do? Sure you do, don't you? Because they already know what God wants them to do and they don't want to do it. And they act like they're, they're trying to fool God and they act like, well, the Lord let me by with it. I'll act like uh, I forgot about him. But he can read your mind, see. And it's always a sin when you don't ask God what you should do. They didn't trust his spirit to lead them. They took covering, but not of God's spirit. A violent testing time was coming for them. And instead of going to the Lord, lo and behold, they went the wrong way. Instead of going and having a worship service and a prayer service and a praise service and calling a fast when Sennacherib was coming, lo and behold, if they didn't just quit church altogether. And did you know this morning, folks, I have, if I've seen that once, I've seen it 500 times when people have a hard time coming in their life, physical distress, financial disaster, mental problems, family problems, instead of going to God where they should go, they'll just quit church and go out on God and go live for the devil. I know people come to this church right here and live good lives, live for God, serve God until some trouble came. And I'll be John Brown if when their trouble come, you'd have thought, boy, that it really got right. But instead, they went out worse and quit church altogether. They, they, instead of going to church more and more, they got less and less. Many people today, when trouble comes, first thing you do is quit church. My soul, folks, don't do that. Don't quit church. Somebody said, oh, I'm having it so hard about to quit church. That's when you need to go to church. That's when you need God's house, God's people, and the preaching, and the fellowship, and the singing. My soul, folks, if you're having it rough, you need to be in the house of God more than ever before. So I'm just having it so hard, and that's how come I don't come regular. You need to be here more regular than ever if you're having problems. I want you to know it was a sin of commission. Sin of omission, it was a sin of commission. They committed something. Not only what they didn't do, but it's something that they did do. You know what they've done? They added sin to sin. Now, I don't know about this. I'll tell you in about 20 years. I'm still learning. There's a lot of things I, I kind of think, but I can't really preach them yet because living and experience teaches you a lot of things, and the time will tell whether I'm right or not. But I think right now that you just can't commit one sin and stop. Every time you commit a sin, usually you'll have to add another sin to that sin to try to get out of the mess you got into with that first one. When you tell a lie, you've got to tell another lie to get out of that first lie. And you keep adding sin to sin. That's why a person backslides. When you're on a slippery hill and it's got snow and ice on it, if you, start, you don't just slide a little bit and stop. Once you start sliding, you go all the way down. Did you know if you start going down, usually you'll go all the way down unless you're a person of unusual balance and can regain your balance and keep standing. Most people, once you start sliding, you hit the deck. They added sin to sin. I believe that verse is mentioned there somewhere. He said that they may add sin to sin, verse 1. They didn't just have a sin of omission. They had a sin of commission. They rebelled. Let's see what their sin was. You ready? Number one, they rebelled. They said, well, to the rebellious children. What did they rebel against? They rebelled against their convictions and their covenants. They had made a covenant with God. They said, God will live for you. We'll do what you want us to. When hard time comes, they rebelled against it. I want to tell you something, folks. Every time you rebel against the Word of God, and a lot of you do it from time to time, every time you rebel against giving or living right, or doing what the, uh, the Bible says, you're committing a sin against God. The Bible said rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Did you know that that witch down yonder lives down the road here? Most of you this morning would think, boy, she's a terrible sinner. But in God's sight, 
in God's sight, when you rebel against the preached Word of God and refuse to do what that Bible says, you are just as guilty as some woman taking a crystal ball and running around the Ouija board and playing with cards trying to tell somebody's fortune. You're just as bad as witchcraft. You say, I don't think it is. No matter what you think, God said is as the sin of witchcraft. Not only that, but they took counsel from the wrong source. Verse 1, they took counsel, but not of me. They said, uh, what are we going to do? Somebody says, let's go get a counselor. So they went down to the neighborhood, uh, so-and-so, knocked on his door and said, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, is coming down here to kill us all. What shall we do? And they took counsel from each other. That was their source. Of course, that was wrong. The next thing they did, a sin of commission, was they lied. They lied. Verse 9. This is a rebellious people. Lying children. They were a bunch of liars. You know how come they lied? Because they told God back yonder they'd serve Him and trust Him. And whatsoever the Lord our God shall command us, that will we do. Oh, I've heard that same lie a lot of times. I've told that lie myself. Oh, Lord, if you'll just help me, I promise you, I'll do what I'm supposed to do. And then when the trouble's over and times are easy, or when hard times come, we just go right back on what we done told God we'd do. Did you know, does everybody in here know it's a sin to lie? I know we're in the land to see an age and it's bad, but surely everybody right here in the middle of the Bible Belt knows it's a sin to tell a lie, don't you? I mean, if you tell somebody... Of course, nowadays they've got it fancied up. Have you noticed nowadays, I heard somebody on the radio the other day said, uh, if he said that, he was preaching, supposed to have been preaching, and he said, he would cause us to say an untruth. That's a nice way of saying a lie. You ever notice nowadays the preachers say, if you're unsaved? Yeah. They don't say lost no more, they say unsaved. They don't say go to hell no more, they say you'll be separated eternally from God. Have you noticed that on the radio? They don't say, you tell a lie, they say, you'll speak an untruth. And that same one's the one talking about making the Bible plainer so people can understand it. Yeah. But anyway, it's a sin to tell a lie. It is a sin to lie about your income tax. Right. You say, I'm going to give it to church. We don't need that kind. Amen. That's right. Tell the truth. That's if the world freezes over and hell breaks loose, tell the truth. Uh, they used to say a man's word was his bond. Not nowadays, boy. It's come to the place, I ain't talking about the world. I'm talking about church people. You can't depend on what people say no more. I'm, I've, got a, I'm still, I've got a few church member friends and a lot of preacher friends that if they tell me something, as far as I'm concerned, that's it. I say, I believe what they say. I don't believe that lie. Now, you, you know, I've been tricked before and I have been lied to and have been very disappointed, but most of the time, you know, if somebody loves the Lord, you, can, you think they're going to tell you the truth. They say, I'm going to do something by certain such a day. I'm going to be there. I'm going to do that. You think, my soul, surely they're telling the truth. But not nowadays. People lie you and turn their back and claim still to love God. It's always wrong to lie. And then they disregarded the preacher. Verse 10, which say to the seers, see not, to the prophet, prophesy not unto us right things, speak smooth. In other words, they said, uh, we don't care what you say, just as long as it's smooth. Don't tell us what's right, just tell us what sounds good. Do you know there's about five, six hundred people in McDowell County right now, while I'm preaching to you, that are in church, and they're not there because they want to hear what's right. They're there because they want to hear what sounds good to them. They want to be told everything's okay, and they're a fine fellow and going to heaven when they die. They, they could care less about right and wrong. Just want to know what sounds good. Today's coming, folks, when, when they're going to shake their face to them preachers' faces and curse them and say, why didn't you tell me the truth? And then the next part of their sin of commission was they fled upon horses. Verse 16, son, they got on them horses and took off a running. And that was a sin. When God says sit still, it's wrong to run. When God says run, it's wrong to sit still. It all depends on what God's directions are for the, perf uh, for the time. Not only that, but it was a sin of disappointment. 
wasn't just a sin of omission, a sin of commission, but it was a sin of disappointment. You know what the word disappointment means? Disappointment means to fail to satisfy the hopes and the expectations of. Isn't that true of all sin? They were ashamed and disappointed. Look at verse 5. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be a help, nor a profit, but a shame and reproach. You know what God said? God said, if you want to go down there in Israel, Egypt, you want to get the Egyptians to help you, you just remember one thing, buddy. They will not profit you. You'll be ashamed, and you will be ashamed. You're always ashamed. A sin of disappointment. You were made no better by, they were not made one bit better by going down there to Egypt for help. Sin is always like that. Sin looks good, but it always sell, fails to satisfy the expectations that it promises you. Sure you know that. i tell you something about that taking counsel. You better watch who you take counsel from. You girls, you'll go to school and the girls say, well, so-and-so, there, he's a good old boy. Why don't you go out with him and everything? And you say, Mama, what do you think about it? No. You'll say, prophesy not unto me right things. Speak smooth things. Tell me what I want to hear. That's the way to get a good crowd these days. Tell them what they want to hear. And boy, you'll go home and you'll say, well, the girls at school think he's all right. Oh, mom and preacher, they're kind of about half out of it anyway. But you better watch who you listen to. You better watch it. Them people just tell you what you want to hear. They ain't your friends. They say, come on, get high, man. You can't get hooked on it. They will. They'll tell you marijuana's not habit forming, all kind of stuff. To get you to do what they want you to do. But they're always tricking you. And you'll always fail to be satisfied with your sin. You know why I know that? Because the Bible tells us so. I, was on, I remember hearing about this train that was going down the road years ago, passenger train. And there's a woman and a little baby on the, plan, on the train, and she, she didn't have any education, didn't know where she was supposed to get off. She's talking to this man beside her, and he said, Oh, I have rode these railways for years. I'll tell you when you're supposed to get off. She said, Well, thank you, sir. I sure appreciate that. And what a relief she felt. And so... They went on down the road and the train stopped. She said, is this my stop? And he said, no, but yours is the next one. So they went on down the road and after a while, it was a big snow blizzard out, outside and the train just barely moving. And they went on down through there and, he said, and the train stopped again. And she said, well, this is my stop. I'll see you later. Thanks a lot. And, and she just opened the door and got off. The train took off. A few minutes later, they stopped again. And the man said, I wonder where we're at now. And when they stopped, they found out that they was at the place where that woman was supposed to get off at. And he said, oh, my Lord, what did we stop back there for? And they said, well, something happened with the train with the brakes, and we stopped to fix them. And he said, oh, no, there's a woman got off back there. And so they went back and tried to find her, and the snow was about that deep, and the blizzard went, and that woman had staggered off down in that snow. Her and the baby both was laying there froze to death. She, she took counsel from that old boy. What she should have done is checked it out to make sure he's telling her what was right. I want to tell you young people something here this morning. You'll have people tell you, oh, come on, it don't hurt nothing. I did it and I'm all right. I did it and it don't bother me. We do it all the time. But you better watch who you listen to. They'll give you some false counsel. It'll not profit you, but be ashamed and reproach. I want to say this right quick. Whatever you trust in besides God will wind up being your ruin. 
I don't care what it is. If you trust in this piano and not God, somehow another piano will wind up being your ruin. Anything, if a man trusts in the liquor bottle instead of God, the liquor bottle will do him in. Whatever you trust besides God, when you should be trusting God, will wind up being your destruction. If you trust your money, your money will ruin you. If you trust your job, your job will go down. If you trust your health, your health will be gone. If you trust your, your abilities, your abilities, you'll lose them. Whatever you trust in the place of God, you'll wind up losing. Wind up being your shame. I read about this guy got on a plane and he's going to Beirut. And this guy suffocated and died while he's up there in the flight. He had that whatever I got yesterday. Airplane fatigue. And brother, he, he got up there and suffocated and couldn't breathe and he died. And when they got him to the airport, they, you know what they found? They found out he was a smuggler. And he had over, over 500 Swiss watches that he stole and wrapped around his body. Had him in a little case that wrapped around his body real tight. And he thought, boy, I'll get in here, you know, and they'll never see these things. And I'm, he's trusting in them riches, you see. But when he got up there at that high altitude, he couldn't breathe and suffocated and choked to death. Whatever you trust in, besides God, will wind up doing you in, buddy. I don't care what or who it is. They should have looked at God, said, God, you can help us. I know you can do it. But instead they said, no, we're going to get man to help us. I will say something right here, folks. That's why, I don't know if I get the rest of this message or not, but that's why so many churches are in a mess today. We depend on man's machinery and man's methods and good singing and professional type preaching to get the job done that God wants to do in his church. God's, hey, I want to tell you something. Here's a good old saying. You can't expect too little from man nor too much from God. You can't expect too little from man, nor too much from God. Right quickly, number two this morning. Number one, their dirty sin. Number two, their disappointed Savior. Their dirty sin caused them to have. Help me out here, moms. Their dirty sin caused them to have a disappointed Savior. He didn't plan for them to live like this. And I'll just give you these points and move on right quickly. He didn't plan for him to live like that. He said, I am. Whatever you need, I am. I will help. He's disappointed in three ways. Number one, he's disappointed with their words. He said, you got counsel? You call Egypt and ask for help. It never is God's will for his children to get help from Egypt. Not the spiritual help that they need. I want to tell you something, folks. I wouldn't give them, a man that's not saved the time of day to teach me the Bible. Amen. It's not God's will for us to get help from the world that He wants us to get from Him and His Word and His work. You say, well, I know an old guy. He, he's been around. He's got an education. If he don't know God, if he's one of Pharaoh's bunch, if he belongs to Egypt, he can't help the work of God. I, I, I'd be willing to go so far as this. And I've got to be careful what I'm getting ready to say. If we're all time soliciting funds from the world, God won't bless them near as much as He would where God's people just got down and give it their way. Now, I'm not saying the money's any different. And if there's a man out here who wants to give us $100,000, we'll accept it. We'll just quote that old verse that says, The Lord loveth a cheerful giver, He also accepteth from a grouch. Good old verse of Scripture. And God can use it, but it never has been God's plan for the world to help the church to do the work that God called the church to do. To hear some preachers get on the radio, you'd think that God was bankrupt and we was having to get the devil to support us to do the work of God. And I believe they stand back and laugh at us because they think, here, you know, you hear of old, uh, the, the rock singers, everybody else gets on there. They just pay for their own time and do their thing. And God's people get on there and start begging them for money and saying, then I say, I sure would like to see you get saved and get what I want, what I've got. Yeah. 
No, God was disappointed with their words. They would not consult God. Now I want to tell you this morning, if you've got problems, I tell you what, if you've got a deep problem that bothers you, first thing you ought to do is call on the Lord. First and foremost, if you still feel like you need further help in getting to God, call your pastor. That's, what I, that's part of my job is to help you to find God's will and direction in things, your problems. If you don't have a pastor, get a hold of a Christian friend. Get somebody that can help you find out what God wants you to do. But I'll tell you what, they're not doing that nowadays. Most people get, most people get in trouble and get in a hard time and they say, well, fooey, I'm tired of going to church. I'm just going to go live in sin. The devil will take care of me. No, he won't. And God was disappointed with their words. Not only that, he is disappointed with their actions. You did notice where it said they walked down to go into Egypt, don't you? You always walk down when you go that way. You cannot leave God's presence and go towards Egypt without going down. I don't care how bad it seems in here. We're still a lot higher up than they are out there. I don't care how bad. You know what? We could have cuss fights in here. And be knocking the deacons be throwing rocks. And the Sunday school teachers kicking each other's eyes out. We'd still be better off than the world is. You say, oh, things went wrong at church and I just quit. You went. I guarantee you one thing. If you quit church, you'll go down. You say, I'm tired of it. Yeah, but you'll go down when you leave. You mark that down in your book. He's disappointed with their actions. You know what that bunch done? When they was fighting Syria, they went to the Assyrians and got help. And then Assyria jumped on them. They went to Egypt to get help. And God said, just sit still and I'll take care of you. Not only that, but the Lord was disappointed with their testimony. Sure was. You know why he's disappointed with their testimony? That was a bad testimony of them Egyptians. You imagine them going down there and say, uh, Mr. Pharaoh, have you got some men that could come and help us out fight Sennacherib, king of Assyria? Now in the back of Pharaoh's mind, it, with his mouth he's saying, sure, we'll help you out, kiddies. But in the back of his mind he's thinking, I thought you had a big God. And it made them think less of God. When we debase ourselves, and sink to the place where we go to the world for our enjoyment and our big times and our thrills and something to keep us happy and satisfied. You know what we're saying to the world? Our God don't satisfy us. And that's why you can't get them to come to the house of God where if they're doing the same things they are to try to be happy and satisfied. And it never has been God's will. God said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Every time God's children has to go to the world, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't, you can't go to the grocery store. I'm not saying that you can't have a good time. I'm not saying you can't have a picnic, that you can't enjoy yourself and, and uh, have a good time. But don't never think that you have to go to the world's methods and world's means to satisfy you because that's what God does. And God wants us to believe that He can satisfy us. We don't have to have that junk they got. Amen. If we do, we, they think, well, good night. Their God ain't, ain't much. Disappointed with their testimony. Right quick, number three. I'm going to say this and I must move on right quick. Not only their dirty sin, not only their disappointed Savior, but lastly, we see their divine sentence. Their divine sentence. You see, God didn't let them get by with this thing. He pronounced a sentence. Notice the sentence was written in a book. Verse 8, the Lord said now, Isaiah, go, write it. Don't just preach it, write it. Before them in a table, hang it up publicly, and note it in a book. That turned out to be the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isaiah didn't know when he wrote that, that people, millions of people, thousands of years later, would read his words. You never know what God's going to do with what little bit you do for him. 
I mean, if you don't do nothing but give the preacher a drink of water, if you don't do nothing but open the door and help the pe- shake the people's hands when they come in, you don't know what good thing God in years to come can make come out of that. He told Isaiah, he said, just write it down in the book. Oh, Isaiah started writing. He didn't know that Danny Castle would be preaching at 200 and something people in, in 1983. And it's been preached to millions and millions before this. The Lord said, write it in a book. Now, there's two or three great things here. I'm going to mention them. Go on. You can study them. Number one, you see here the preservation of the Scriptures. You know what he said there in verse 8? Write it in a book, Isaiah, that it may be from time to come forever and ever. There's a verse that promises the Lord would preserve that message Isaiah wrote. He preserved it. And the Lord wrote it in a book. The prophets didn't just preach, most of them. They wrote a lot of what they said. Not only that, of course, they wouldn't be accepted in a lot of churches nowadays if they wrote it. Some of the greatest sermons ever been preached, the man just stood up here and didn't raise his voice and read it word for word. Boy, nowadays in a lot of little country churches I've been to, son, he would just be a backslider for sure if he did that. I mean, they don't even believe in having notes. They believe if you can understand what the man's saying, he's compromising in a lot of churches. That's the truth. They think you got to slobber and spit all over the first three aisles and not understand the words you say to get in the Spirit. Yeah, that's right. And I'm not knocking I'm not preaching hard. I preach hard myself. I want you to know God works in a different way. And He told Isaiah, write it in a book. You know what God told Isaiah about this book? Brother, the Bible is wrote for three reasons. Number one, to shame the men of the present age. He said, write it in a book, Isaiah. Show their shame to everybody. You know why the Bible is written? To show the men of the age in which it was written in. That's right. David sure didn't have no idea that half the population of the world would find out what he'd done. <laughs> you think about that now. I ain't said, I got this thing here. There ain't nobody here but me and Bathsheba. He didn't know that thing be told from generation to generation to generation to generation and millions of people would study about it. What if God took that little thing that you've got hid, blasted that thing all over the world? Boy, that's scary, isn't it? It's a shame the men of the present age. Not only that, second reason the Bible is written is to justify God so people wouldn't think Him to be too severe. If, 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 uh, if they didn't tell us about all them men's sins and we'd heard about how God judged them, we'd say, boy, God sure is mean. But when God relocates their sin and writes their sin down, then we say, amen, God's just. They deserved it. They had it coming to them. And number three, the Bible was written to warn others not to do as them people did. You know why God records the sins of Samson? Not for you to sit and read it like a playboy book. God records the sins of those men to keep us from making the same mistakes they made. You know why God recorded the mistake of Judas? To keep you from selling out the Lord. You know why God recorded in there about Demas hath forsaken me, love this present world? To keep you from loving this present world and forsaking God. You know why God put it in there about Achan stealing and getting his skill and losing his family? So you wouldn't steal and lose your home and your health and family. It was written in a book. Now, the second thing about their divine sentence, it was spoken with authority. Look at verse 12, boy. Oh, Isaiah gets up and says, Wherefore? Wherefore? Isaiah surveyed the situation. He said, You're going to run. Uh, that's uh, verse 12 there, chapter 30. And he said, You said you're going to flee on horses. You say you're going to go down there. I have surveyed the whole situation, and I have a divine sentence from the Lord. You listening? Wherefore? And buddy, he began to let it fly. No ifs, ands, much, babies, perhaps, maybe, perhaps it might have been. It could be this way. I don't know if it's supposed to be that way. It might be that way. You better watch out. You might mess up. Mess up. No, Isaiah didn't talk like that. He said, wherefore, you're going to get it, and this is what you're going to get. Written in a book. Spoken with authority. Let's see what he told them. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despised this word, and they did, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and they did. Verse 13, therefore, I like them two words, wherefore and therefore. Therefore, this iniquity, your sin, 
What did I tell you a while ago? Whatever you trust in beside God will wind up being your ruin. Look what he told them. This iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. He said it'd be like a great big wall or a dam, and it was swelling out and holding the flood tides back, and all of a sudden it'd break. Now, some of you in here this morning... You may have never been saved. And you are trusting in something. Everybody in this room is trusting in something or somebody. Might be your bank account. Might be your job, your home, your family, your own self-righteousness, your church membership. Everybody in here is trusting in something or somebody. And I want to tell you this morning, if you're trusting in anything or anybody beside the Lord, whatever you're trusting in will break suddenly. And become your ruin. It'll break suddenly like a house on the sand that fell and destroyed the man that built it. They made their chain heavy and God made their plagues great. Therefore, look what he said in verse 16. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee. And we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. God said, all right, we'll play it your way. You go help, you go get Pharaoh to help you. Sennacherib is coming down here to get you. Go on, ask Pharaoh to help if you want to. But remember, I've got the power to let old Sennacherib's horses be just as fast as your horses. And they're going to catch up with you and get you. That was the sentence. But thank God, not only was their divine sentence written in a book and spoken with authority, but last of all, it was mixed with mercy. Hallelujah for that. Even in all of that, even in all of God's anger, and in all of God's wrath on them, He always mixes some mercy in there. I thank God. You know what? There was a time in my life when I was under the condemnation and wrath of God. God said, Danny Castle, you're going to hell when you die and burn forever. But if you'll believe on my son, you can have everlasting life. Their divine sentence was mixed with mercy. Hallelujah. I'm glad God mixes it with mercy. Now there's going to come a day when mercy will be left out. He'll have judgment without mercy. But here in this story this morning, the judgment was mixed with mercy. God may have pronounced a divine sentence on you today. God may have said, you've only got so long before hard times come your way. But always in the ring of God's voice, there's a mixture of mercy in there. That's what he means in the back of chapter 3 and verse 2, where he said, in wrath, remember mercy. Verse 17, you know what he said there? One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. Rebuke of five shall you flee till you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain. That could mean that some of them escaped. The ones that really trusted God. The Lord said, I'm not going to kill all of you because there's still two or three of you that'll, that'll trust me. And I'm going to take care of you. The whole world's under condemnation this morning. But God looks down and He says, I'll not destroy you with the world. You can have mercy this morning from God. Really, you can. The whole world is under the wrath of God this morning, but you can have mercy. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Yes, sir, it is. Those who would sit still and wait would be saved, even though the majority went the wrong way. Revelation chapter 3, there was a church that hated God and was ugly and poor and blind and naked. And you know what the Lord said in Revelation 3.20? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man will hear my voice and open, I'll come in to him. The whole world's in bad shape this morning, but God's willing to do business with you right here in this service today as an individual. That's mixed with mercy. It was like God was saying, I'll help you out. I know you're in the wrong, but I'll still help you out if you'll trust me. It's like God was saying, I'll take part of the punishment. I'll take part of the blame. I'll give you this story and I'm through. The law of the Locretians, a, I think it was a tribe over in Africa, when they'd get a new king or a ruler over their tribes, they'd always make some real stiff regulations. 
And so they got a new king one day, and his new regulation was this. He said, the first person in this kingdom that commits adultery, we're going to put out both of his eyes on the spot. We're going to straighten up around here. And the first person that committed adultery was that man's son. And it broke his heart. And he said, I know I've got to judge him. And I know I'm the judge, but I'm also a father. And I've got to have mercy. So you know what he done? He told the law, he said, the law must stand. I'm still the judge. I'm still the king. The law must be upheld. But he said, I'm a father, and I've got mercy. Put out one of my son's eyes, and put out one of my eyes. And so the king told him, he said, I tell you what, I will give one of my eyes if you'll let my son keep one of his. Brother, that's just like God, you know it. We was a sinner. We was the one guilty. God hadn't done nothing. But God said, I'll let my son die if you just let them live. Thank God his son died so that old sinners like me and you could live this morning. Hallelujah, I'm glad for that. There's always mercy mixed in with the wrath of God. Your strength is to sit still. If you're having problems, just hold your horses. God's going to help you. If you're here this morning and you're not right with God, you're trusting in something else, the Lord's able to help you. Give you what you need. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. While they come and get us a song, Holy Spirit of God may spoke to somebody's heart this morning. If he did, we're going to give you a chance to come to this altar and pray. If you're here this morning, are you trusting in Jesus? If you're not, I invite you to come this morning. Take him as your personal Savior. Turn your life over to him today. If there's a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl in here this morning, I'd say, Brother Danny, I know that I've tried to do it my way, and I ain't been trusting the Lord. I know that I'm wrong. Help me. Would you help pray for me? Would you slip up your hand? Slip up your hand. Take it right back down. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Young lady, God bless you. Somebody else. All right, I see your hand. God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord. Amen. Is there a, I see your hand. Thank you. Is there somebody in here? God bless you, brother. Somebody in here would say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. And I know if I was to die right now, I'd go to hell. And I don't want to. And I, I want to be saved. Would you pray for me? Would, would you slip up your hand? Take it right back down. We're not going to come to you or embarrass you. We're just going to pray for you. Nobody's going to try to twist your arm, get you to do anything. We just want to remember you in prayer. Slip up your hand. Take it right back down. Would you? Would you anywhere? Right quick. Say, remember me in this prayer. You be honest enough before God to admit it. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you back there, young lady. I see your hand. Is there somebody else? Somebody else. This will not save you. God bless you, sir. Amen, ma'am. I see those hands. At least four or five hands gone up right here this morning. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Say, I'm not saved, but I want the church to pray for me. All right, we're going to pray. We're going to give an invitation. If you need to come. Why not this morning? Anything you trust besides the Lord will be a disappointment and a shame and a reproach. Why don't you come and trust him who said I am. He who said I will. And he'll help you. Father, help them. Lord God. Oh God, you know what needs to be done this morning. Lord, I'm, I'm helpless. I can't do anything else. I've tried to preach, Lord. Tried to tell them what you want them to know. Oh, blessed Lord. Help them, Father. To now respond and come to Jesus. Put it all on this altar this morning. Help these that lifted their hands. Lord, to make that step today. Turn that life over to Jesus. 
we'll praise you. In your name, amen. Let's stand.